So let's take our Bibles tonight, open up with me to the book of Galatians chapter 4. Uh, Galatians chapter 4 tonight as we return to Galatians and we're in the section of this book that we've called Freedom, Not Bondage. Uh, it would be awesome, this is one of the drawbacks, I think every pastor probably feels this way, probably every Sunday school teacher, it would be awesome if you could preach a book of the Bible without stopping. You know, just start in the first chapter and go through the last chapter and say, oh, what would we do with the book of Psalms? You know, uh, it's like, wow, we could be here for a while. Uh, but it would be nice if we could do that or at least go through an entire section so we could keep the continuity. Uh, chapters 3 and 4 of Galatians go together, and they're in this section of freedom, not bondage. The first seven verses that we looked at uh, last week, we saw that in the days of Old Testament, uh, the law was, it kind of treated the children of Israel like kindergartners. It taught them the basics. It taught them the ABCs, if you will. It laid a good foundation. Warren Wiersbe wrote, for some 15 centuries, Israel had been in kindergarten and grade school, learning their spiritual ABCs so that they would be ready when Christ would come. Then they would get the full revelation for Jesus Christ is the Alpha and Omega. Now these churches are trying to bring back all of the Old Testament ABCs, if you will. They're trying to bring back the old practices and things like that and incorporate it into the church. As we study through this tonight, and something that I'm going to show you, maybe you thought as we've studied the book of Galatians that this is something that it really doesn't connect real well with us today. And you say, well, I don't think that we try to bring the Old Testament into the New Testament time period. We're going to see tonight that one of the problems that was going on here in Galatians is the exact same thing that's happening today. And when I say the exact same thing, that's exactly what I mean. And we'll see that tonight. Galatians chapter 4, there's three things we're going to look at this evening. First of all, Galatians 4 verses 8 through 11 it shows us the Galatians' problem. The Galatians' problem. In verse 8, it says, How be it then, when ye knew not God, ye did service unto them which by nature are no gods? But now, after that ye have known God, or rather are known of God, how turn ye again to the weak and the beggarly elements, whereunto ye desire again to be in bondage? Ye observe days and months and times and years, I am afraid of you, lest I have bestowed upon you labor in vain. The Galatians' problem. This letter, written to the churches of Galatia, Galatia is a region that is now modern-day Turkey. And as you look at a map uh, on the continent of Asia, in Paul's day, this province would have included the regions of Pisidia, Phrygia, and Laconia. The B.C. years, the before Christ years, of the, the people that would be saved and are now in the church of Galatia, those B.C. years were years that were riddled in idolatry. Keep a marker here. Let's go to the book of Acts chapter 14. When I say idolatry, I am talking uh, the idolatry of the Greeks and the Romans. Uh, they have incorporated it. Uh, the Romans, they, the Greeks have taken the Roman gods. They have made them their gods. They have... Uh, Whatever the Roman God was for something, the Greeks had their God for the same thing, so just different names. But in uh, Acts chapter 14, verse 8, And there sat a certain man at Lystra, impotent in his feet, being a cripple from his mother's womb, who never had walked. The same heard Paul speak, who steadfastly, beholding him, and perceiving that he had faith to be healed, said with a loud voice, Stand upright on thy feet. And he leaped and walked. And when the people saw what Paul had done, they lifted up their voices, saying in the speech of Laconia, the gods are come down to us in the likeness of men. And they called Barnabas Jupiter and Paul Mercurius because he was the chief speaker. And then the, then the priest of Jupiter, which was before their city, brought oxen and garlands under the gates and would have done sacrifice with the people. So here we have God's men. They have exercised the, the apostolic ministry of these miracles. This individual has been healed. And the people of the region of Galatia, these churches, said, you're gods. They worshiped pagan idolatry. 
It would seem that once they were saved, they left the pagan idolatry and now have reached back into the Old Testament. They say, oh, well, we've missed something here. You know, we had all these pagan gods. We're not going to do that anymore. But we've missed something. We need to go back into the Old Testament days and find out what was it that we got that we missed out on. And we need to bring that in and incorporate that into Christianity. Now, as we look at this tonight, some powerful truths jump out. Three truths. The first truth is this. In verse 9, the question, does God know you? Does God know you? Verse 9, again, uh, back here in Galatians chapter 4, verse 9 again says, but now after that ye have known God, or rather are known of God. There's a lot of people in our world today that would claim that they know God. And they could take great quizzes and pass on jeopardy, any of the biblical questions that are asked, and, and all these kinds of things. They say, we know God. Well, that's all well and good, but does God know you? Turn to Matthew 7. We looked at this on Wednesday night, but we're going to use it again for tonight's message. Again, in Matthew chapter 7, if you would, starting in verse 21. Matthew 7 and verse 21. The Bible says that not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father, which is in heaven. Many will say unto me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name, and in thy name have cast out devils, and in thy name done many wonderful works? Then I will profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. Verse 22, essentially, they're saying, God, we knew you. Oh, we knew all about you. We knew how to do these things. We knew how to act and, and, and act, do the part, you know, of a Christian. We did all these churchy things. We knew you. But God says, I don't know you. Better to be known of God than to walk around saying you know God. Tonight, does God know you? Can you say beyond any shadow of a doubt that you have a relationship to God through Jesus Christ, your Lord? Can you, point, can you pinpoint that time in your life where you were born again and where you became known of God? Second thing is this tonight. Do we have spiritual idols? Do we have spiritual idols? If I was to ask us tonight if we have idols, immediately we might think back to like the Jupiter and Mercurianus, Mercurianus or whatever his name was and all those different idols. We may think of a Buddha statue or something like that. We say, well, of course not. I don't have any idols. But do we practice idolatry? Take your Bible and go to 1 John chapter 2. 1 John chapter 2 tonight. In our world, there's a lot of things that maybe here, we would sit here tonight and say, no, I don't have you know, money's not my idol, material things, that's not my idol, my job, my sports, hobbies, people, no, that's not my idols. Well, in 1 John 2, verses 15 and 16, the Bible tells us to love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. And if any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. And the world passeth away, and the lust thereof, but he that doeth the will of God abideth forever. When you stop and you think about those verses, that lays out the three criteria for what makes an idol. An idol is that which we lust after in the flesh, which we lust after with our eyes, or the pride of life. Spiritual idolatry. I want you to think about this for a moment. Uh, one of the things that popped into my mind as I was studying this is the health, wealth, and prosperity gospel. That is idolatry. I mean, it's not just false doctrine, which it is, but it's idolatry. It is the promotion of my health, my wealth, and my prosperity by whatever means is necessary. And here's how the doctrine goes. The doctrine says that if I have health, wealth, and prosperity, I must be walking close to God. If I don't have health, wealth, and prosperity, I'm not walking close to God. That's what idolatry is all about. That's what idolatry is all about. As Baptists, we say, well, we denounce that doctrine. We don't believe in that. You're 100% right. 
But I think in Baptist churches all across this land, and if you study historically Baptist churches, you find out that we have our own little pet idols. Idols like if I give more money in the offering, if I attend more church services, the dowdier I dress, the shorter I keep my hair, the longer I keep my dress, the louder I sing, the more times that I amen the message, the more offices I hold, the more hours I spend witnessing. Oh, if I just do those, wow, I'm in, I am maturing in the Lord and I am pleasing God. Where does the Bible say that? That is not the course, that is not the path to spiritual maturity. Should we do those things? Well, of course we should do those. But not so that we can be pleasing to God, not so that we are spirit, thinking we're spiritually maturing. We do those because we have matured, and we have matured by growing in God's grace. So spiritual idolatry can creep into our lives. Here's the third lesson, though. There is a modern-day danger in what is taught in Galatians that is as applicable for today as it was back then. There is something called the Hebrew Roots Movement. Have you heard of that? I had not really heard of that until I started studying on this. And uh, several, it's amazing when you're studying how many light bulbs start popping on and you're starting to understand some of the things you've seen and heard in different places. The Hebrew Roots Movement is actually something that began in the early 20th century but has recently picked up momentum. Uh, in fact, as I was looking on the website, I thought, well, I'm going to just go to their website. Oh, I, oh, I'm sure I can't find anything. In Bryan, little old Bryan, Ohio, there are two Hebrew Roots Movement churches. In Montpelier, there's one. They all meet in homes. They all meet in homes. But what it is, uh, Got Questions Ministries writes this and explains it this way. The Hebrew Roots Assemblies are often made up of a majority of Gentiles, including Gentile rabbis. Usually they prefer to be identified as Messianic Christians, although there are many different and diverse Hebrew Roots Assemblies with variations in their teachings. They all adhere to a common emphasis on recovering the original Jewishness of Christianity. Their assumption is that the church has lost its Jewish roots and is unaware that Jesus and his disciples were Jews living in obedience to the Torah. For the most part, those involved advocate the need for every believer to walk a Torah-observant life. This means that the ordinances of the Mosaic Covenant must be a central focus in the lifestyle of believers today as it was with the Old Testament Jews of Israel. Keeping the Torah includes keeping the Sabbath on the seventh day of the week, which is Saturday, celebrating the Jewish feasts and festivals, keeping the dietary laws, avoiding the paganism of Christianity, and learning to understand the scriptures from a Hebrew mindset. That's the Hebrew Roots Movement. I know two families that are involved in that, and I didn't know that's what they were. And that is what they were. In fact, I found out that one of them in Montpelier, uh, has, it's, I'm not going to tell you who it is or anything like that, but it was the person I knew. It's like, huh, that explains a lot. Folks, that's wrong. And it would seem to me that the people that are involved in the Hebrew Roots Movement, if they would read the book of Galatians, Galatians is opposed to it. We are not supposed to become Messianic Gentiles. I'm not a, a Gentile rabbi. We're not going to start observing the feasts and the moons and all that kind of stuff. Paul said this. And I'm like, where in the world do they get this from? But this is one of the biggest growing movements. When I pulled up the website and it showed the Google map and it showed all the pens, I could not believe how many pens there were all over the United States. And believe it or not, in, in Midwest America is where the most pens were. There is a desire in Midwest America to return to our Jewish roots. Uh, no, I'm a Gentile Christian, and I'm not called to follow this stuff. I'm not called to do these things. I'm not going back under bondage. I'm free in God's grace. Are you tonight? 
Unbelievable. Let's look at the next section. Galatians chapter 4, verse 12. Galatians 4 and verse 12, Brethren, I beseech you, be as I am, for I am as ye are. Ye have not injured me at all. Ye know how through infirmity of the flesh I preached the gospel unto you at the first. And my temptation, which was in my flesh, ye despise not, nor rejected, but received me as an angel of God, even as Christ Jesus. Where is then the blessedness you spake of? For I bear you record that if it had been possible, ye would have plucked out your own eyes and have given them to me. Am I therefore become your enemy because I tell you the truth? The second thing we look at tonight is the apostle's predicament. The apostle's predicament, he has two problems tonight. The first problem is Paul's failing health. Paul's failing health. Go with me back to 2 Corinthians chapter 12. 2 Corinthians chapter 12, look with me at verse 7. Familiar passage here. 2 Corinthians chapter 12 and verse 7. Paul says, "...unless I should be exalted above measure through the abundance of the revelation, there was given to me a thorn in the flesh, the messenger of Satan, to buffet me, lest I should be exalted above measure." For this thing I besought the Lord thrice, that it might depart from me. And he said unto me, My grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in mine infirmities, that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Therefore I take pleasure in infirmities, in reproaches, in necessities, in persecutions, in distresses for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then I am strong. Paul's health failure. What was wrong with Paul? <laughs> People have speculated and debated that for years, haven't they? What was Paul's infirmity in the flesh? The Bible doesn't tell us. What we do know is that evidently Paul's infirmity was visible. Because as he talks to the Galatians, he essentially says to them, you can see what's wrong with me and you weren't repulsed by it. You weren't turned off. You weren't disgusted by it. But instead, you receive me. You receive me graciously. You receive me with sympathy and with love. And in fact, and this is where sometimes people think it was probably his eyesight. Why else would he have said, you would have given me your own eyes? Now, was that the issue? The Bible doesn't tell us specifically. If you want to think it was his eyesight, okay. If you think it was something else, okay. I'm not going to fight you about it. But whatever it was, Paul's health health was failing, and the Galatians had a tender attitude towards him. But verse 16 of Galatians chapter 4, the second predicament that we have here is the Galatians' failure to be humble. He says, am I therefore become your enemy because I tell you the truth? Paul has been influential in bringing these people to Christ. They have been saved by grace through faith. Now they are turning back to law, thinking that they have to do this for spiritual maturity. Paul has been dealing with them, and evidently, they're not receiving the truth very well. Do we recognize that today we are living in a land where the truth is not received very well? And we are watching it happen worse and worse every single day. Most likely, you have followed the school shooting situation that took place in Nashville. If you've paid any attention to the media and what the media has said and what the media has done and what the politicians have said and done, you find out that some of the loudest and the strongest voices have ridiculed in two areas. Number one, gun control. Once again, it's the gun's fault. You know that gun that was just laying there? It got up on its own and it went on a killing spree, didn't it? So it's the gun's fault. And so the liberals are going bonkers over that nonsense. But the second thing that they're doing is they're attacking Christianity. They have vilified Christianity because people have called for our nation to pray. And the liberal politicians out there have said, quit asking for prayer, do something. And they have mocked and ridiculed the faith. Not only that, but you can tell how the liberals are involved in this. CBS News ordered their people to no longer refer to the shooter as transgender. 
Oh, we wouldn't want anybody to think that played a factor into it. That this individual that is mixed up about their gender is also mixed up about a lot of other things too. We wouldn't want people to come to that conclusion, so don't use that word anymore. Call her Audrey, because that was her name. What was his name? Why aren't we calling him that? Oh, that, no. That's where our sick, perverted world is at today. While all this is happening, Forsyth Tech School in North Carolina, and I guess I expect better things out of the Carolinas. But if you saw any of the vulgar pictures that were put up, they bring in this drag show, and some drag queen is straddling a 14-year-old student as they're putting on their show. Drag queen story hour is at public libraries, and welcomed, open arms, embraced, while Kirk Cameron and his book tour as he is reading As You Grow, a book that's trying to bring this nation back to what godly morality is all about. Kirk Cameron is being fought at every turn of the road. He's being joined with the likes of Missy Robertson from Duck Dynasty and uh, Senator Crenshaw, Representative Crenshaw, whichever he is, and other, other people that are conservative voices. And they're being fought against. But the drag show queens can come in all their drag paraphernalia and sit there and read their books to the kids, and people think that's great. Folks, this is disgusting. This is absolutely disgusting. We are watching a rapidly growing hatred in America for biblical truth, and it is a hatred that has grown exponentially since we have had the current resident in the White House. Now, if that upsets you and you think I'm being political, I'm not. I'm being factual. Go check the facts out. And notice how the current resident has done everything possible to get as many of the LGBTQ, whatever they are now, into offices, into cabinet positions, and is proud of it. This is a disgusting situation our nation is in. And how many people, if we tell them the truth, We've become their enemy. Well, that was Paul's predicament as well. But let's notice the final thing here tonight. Galatians chapter 4, verse 17. The third point tonight is the enemy's pull. The enemy's pull in Genesis, or Galatians chapter 4, verse 17. They zealously affect you, but not well. Yea, they would exclude you that ye might affect them. But it is good to be zealously affected always in a good thing, and not only when I am present with you. My little children, of whom I travail in birth again until Christ be formed in you, I desire to be present with you now and to change my voice, for I stand in doubt of you. Several things, something in each verse. First of all, verse 17. The enemy, the false teachers, want to pull them away from the truth and pull them into bondage. They want to take them away from the freedom that they have in the Lord Jesus Christ. You know, that's how cults operate. They try to pull people away from a, a, a loving home, a loving church, pull them out of a loving church, pull them out of truth. That's how the cults want to operate, and then they want to separate you. Keep you away from anything that might pull you back. Bruce Barton writes this, he says, Religious slavery, trying to please God by legalism or works, is particularly devastating to people because it offers a false hope. Thinking they will gain freedom, they instead get trapped in a cycle of effort and failure leading to more effort and failure. Opportunities to return to religious slavery occur almost every day. And when we have fallen short of our expectations, we are tempted to try harder and be more disciplined. But when we fail in the Christian life, we should apply grace, not renewed effort, as the primary means for becoming right again. That's where we as believers in Christ cannot fall prey to the enemies that are wanting us to be pulled into bondage of whatever sort it might be. Verse 18, it says, It is good to be zealously affected always in a good thing. You know, zeal's a good thing. 
We need Christians that are zealous, that are hot, that are hot. I mean, just fired up hot. Tonight, would you be able to describe yourself? Can I describe myself as a zealous Christian? Zealous for good works, zealous to do good, zealous to live right, zealous to know more about God, zealous to be in His will and to be in His service. Are we hot or are we as cold as ice? God's called us to be hot. Verse 19, that phrase, until Christ be formed in you. Paul says, I'm looking for spiritual growth. I'm looking for spiritual growth. That's what he is wanting to see in these people. And then verse 20, he says, I desire to be present with you. I want to change my voice. I wish I could say something different to you. But then he says that I stand in doubt of you. Christians, this is something tonight that we need to consider very, very carefully. Paul says, I stand in doubt of you. Why? Well, because there's so much of their life that doesn't line up. Yesterday, I, I went and saw Pastor Fair, and while I was driving there and back, I listened to one Adrian Rogers sermon after another. And Adrian Rogers, that's got to be the top of my favorite preacher's list. I just love to hear him preach. And he would preach to, I don't know how many people were at Bellevue Baptist Church. It's a huge church. I mean, you look behind him, and the choir looked to be the size of our congregation. Uh, it was just gigundous. And he, the cameras flashed up in the balcony, and the balcony was loaded. The teenagers sat in the balcony, and uh, the, the main floor was loaded. And as he is preaching, uh, I tell you what, that was one, one gutsy preacher. And he told his church, he says, you know what? He says, I believe that there are a number of you sitting out here this morning. He preached in the morning. He says, I believe there's a number of you sitting out here this morning that you're a counterfeit Christian. You're a counterfeit Christian. You can, you can talk the talk. You can do all the things that appear to be Christian-y. That's not his word, but my word. But he says, you don't have a relationship to God through Jesus Christ. How in the world, what a judgmental preacher to say something like that, right? How could he say that? The Bible tells us in Matthew chapter 7, Even so, every good tree bringeth forth good fruit, but a corrupt tree bringeth forth evil fruit. A good tree cannot bring forth evil fruit, Neither can a corrupt tree bring forth good fruit. Matthew 12 says, Either make the tree good and his fruit good, or else make the tree corrupt and his fruit corrupt. For the tree is known by his fruit. I can't see anybody's heart. You can't see mine. But what we can see is the fruit on the tree. And if there isn't fruit on the tree, there is a good reason to, to pipe up with Paul here and say, I stand in doubt of you. There's no fruit on the tree, I stand in doubt. Pastor Rogers was saying to his congregation, there's no fruit on the tree for some of you. I stand in doubt. That's an awful place to be. Tonight, look in a mirror, examine the tree. Is there fruit? Is there anything on the tree of your life? that just screams out, I'm a child of God. I have the evidence of Christ in my life. I'm not just going through religion. I'm not just going through motions. I've been born again. I have new life in Christ. I've been transformed from the inside out. And the Lord's still doing a good work in me. Do you have that evidence tonight? Or would Paul have to say, I stand in doubt of you? Tonight, if we know the Lord Jesus Christ is our Savior, we have got to guard against spiritual idolatry or idolatry of any kind. We have got to be zealous for the Lord, living for the Lord every step of every day, avoiding the false teachers that would try to drag us down to pull us away from truth. Will we surrender our heart, Christian, to that tonight? 
But if you're here this evening and you don't know Christ as Savior, you say, you know what, preacher? I don't know for sure if I'm saved. Why would you go another second and not make certain of it? Why would you linger in doubt? Or why would you linger in knowing beyond any shadow of a doubt that you're not saved? Your life could come to an end in a split second. For the believer in Christ, it's absent from the body in the presence of the Lord. Lost person, absent from the body, you're in hell. That fast. Is that really what you want your eternity to look like? Why wouldn't tonight be the night, lost soul, that you'd give your life to Christ, the one who paid for your freedom in his blood? Stand with me, please, with our heads bowed and our eyes closed. Our Heavenly Father, tonight, we thank you for Jesus. We thank you, Lord, for the powerful truths found here in Galatians. And Lord, we want to take these truths and apply them to our lives. Lord, we pray especially for the individual that's here tonight that doesn't know you as Savior. Lord, they're in such spiritual bondage, bound to religion, bound to rules, bound to law, bound to whatever it is that's keeping them from knowing you as Savior. And tonight, I just pray that you would break their heart. Help them, Lord, to see how much God loves them and wants them to be saved. May this be the night of salvation for someone, we pray and ask in the name of Jesus.